Allegedly, the stream key is correct. Theoretically, we are live. We're live? Theor the hypothetically. Oh, uh, we're live, pal. Oh, we're, oh, oh, we're, oh, let me tell you. We're, we're live, okay. Ooh. Yep, it shows, it shows us live. Mm-hmm. You, uh, 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 I know, I know we're, we're under, under the gun. You, we're gunning it. You, you want to just jump right in? Let's go. Okay. All right. <clears throat> mm, let me move your body over here. You do not have to fear. Except for the man of fear. He's seeking the man without fear. Okay. <clears throat> you want to take a sip? Yeah. All right. Three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Justin Robert Young, joined as always by Brian Brushwood. Hey, man. Uh, ever since we uh, always did this show with two people, we made sure that we got the two people who are the scientific -iest. Yep. Yep. Uh, to, on today's it's gonna agenda, gonna be a serious show. It's gonna be a serious show, Brian. Oh, is it? Can't get Brian. Can't get more serious. Don't get silly. I, no, I, why would? Why Don't. Would he? Andrew's gone for one week. Okay, just he's one gone week. for one week, and he's he trusted us. He left one note on the refrigerator. Yes, said you're allowed to order a few pizzas. Whatever you do, don't get too silly. On the show, you have a whole nother podcast where we get silly. Yes. Don't get silly on this one. This oh. is a weird things podcast. We talk about news of the weird and we talk about science. Yep. So, uh, do you, uh, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to cast aspersions. Don't cast an aspersion either. Don't get too silly and don't cast an aspersion. I'm just saying, I'm just saying track record is Andrew leaves. Mm -hmm. New York Times article says, Whoopsie doodle, uh, SpaceX had a boo boo. Oh no! Uh, it, it actually was kind of harrowing because I didn't know what exactly to be looking for as I was reading through. What is what is what is the headline here? I have not read about this. Uh, 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 SpaceX rocket fails. <laughs> the uh, uh, basically the first stage goes off just fine, and uh, it was kind of funny watching the video feed, not knowing when the trouble was going to be. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then it, it's like, well, everything looks good there. And then uh, basically the second stage didn't make it as high as it should in order to properly deploy the Starlink satellites. Yeah. Um, uh, here, I guess. We'll and so that, that's what that's what this was about. This was about uh, launching more Starlink. Uh, yes. And uh, they uh, they uh, Elon tweeted that. Maybe, maybe not. They would be able to get them to the right. Uh, w what is it? Per perigree, uh, whatever the thing is that says they're up high enough. Yeah. But uh, but you can see that here is after this malfunction. Right. Uh, so it, it was the first stage or, or the top stage. The first stage came back home, landed just fine on a drone ship. Second stage had some kind of error. They had to scuttle it in space. Uh, what do they call it? An RUD. Uh, or, or uh, yeah, talk to, talk to Paul. Uh, uh, wait, what? Paul Rudd. Moving on. Oh, never mind. <laughs> they had the, a unscheduled uh, disassembly, a rapid unscheduled disassembly yes. is what they call it. But there you can see the fairing going off. You so can this see is them launching all the satellites, but they know now that it's not as high as it needs to be. Yeah, so my guess is they had some instrumentation that showed that, ooh, we don't have much time and so they just got them out and they're hoping to adjust maybe they'll stay in orbit maybe they won't but uh but apparently it was a uh the the to to quote spacex a quote very rare glitch happened so well yeah i mean the 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 subhead there the new york times article that you had up said it was the first man or the first malfunction like this since 2015 or 2016 uh, which is a mighty long time when you are launching rockets into the sky. It, it is literally rocket science. Uh, so I wonder what is what is happening. We're watching this now, and I guess 
the, uh, you we, can see we, their we, little. We can their listen little... to a little bit of an audio here. You could. Uh, I don't know if they they necessarily make a bunch of panic sounds or anything. Um, here, let me turn on this audio here. Okay, we do have audio. They're just not talking <laughs> at this yeah. moment. But uh, uh, I believe the video keeps going to show the first stage landing again, which again. It's so that is the on the left for anybody. Well, I don't. We don't have a video okay. version of this. So, uh, on, on the left, you see a rocket that is landing and and uh, hitting the the propulsion. But now on the right, you are seeing the rocket that is still in orbit, that seems to be struggling. It's trying to or trying to get to orbit anyway. Yeah. Stage one entry button startup. Yeah. I wonder. I wonder if you can hear them actually. Hey, what's funny is the part that's working just fine is the part that looks like utter chaos on the left. <laughs> yeah, that's the one where the camera is pointing down as uh, now the rocket is firing so it can land correctly onto the drone ship. Uh, uh, meanwhile, the one in space is <laughs> rapidly disassembling. Well, I, I believe that that looks to be a bunch of accumulated CO2 or Case something on the outside. Saved. Yeah, so I don't know. Let's see if we can at least catch the first stage. Uh, this is it's now three kilometers up. Oh, and then they just shut it off. And then they just shut it down. Uh, okay. Stage two is in terminal guidance. Oh, stage two is in terminal guidance. They're saying so. They're like so. They basically they have the stream going. Stage one landing. Like they they point. hold the feed long mm -hmm. enough for like yeah yeah uh, stage one landed. It was fine anyway. That's all for now, folks. Stage one landing confirmed. There we go. And then, and then they, they cut just it. cut it. <laughs> They're like, nothing to see here. Cut it hard. <laughs> this one's a bad one. This one's a bad one. We should have done it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dump it. Dump it. This is a mistake. You know why I can't be troll boy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, but I'll tell you what. It, it, it demonstrates again what we have covered on this podcast for years and years and years, that this is a moment that proves the rule that you could do 300 of these things before something goes wrong. And uh, thankfully it was not on anything that, I mean, it'll cost SpaceX a tremendous amount of money. I mean, these, these launches already are very expensive to like human numbers. They are cheap for rocket launches, which is the reason why they're so popular. But It'll cost them some money, but uh, they they're they're gonna they're gonna learn a lesson, and it's a lesson that's been rare for them because they've been able to do these things so clockwork. Well, and uh, luckily it was a case of it sounds like the majority of the payload. I assume all of it because uh, I believe they had been packing in a bunch of Starlink satellites with almost every other uh, launch that they had been doing. Uh, yeah, but but in this case, I they, believe they this one fire was primarily off some, fire off some uh, Starlinks whenever they whenever they're in the neighborhood. Well, uh, you remember there was that one where they they had a, a rapid unscheduled uh, disassembly mm -hmm. on on uh, on the launch pad during a test run that had a Facebook satellite, and that was kind of like a ooh who who likes practice? Yeah, you, who's ready to try again? Whoopsie doodle. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then, uh, and then, meanwhile, you know, most of the other explosions like this that we've been seeing have been, uh, you know, with the ambitious testing of the Starship. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, and that's but that's a prototype. They are they are still, still getting that into its final form before they actually try to do something with it. Yeah, and by do something, I mean go to space. <laughs> that gigantic. Uh, uh, ocean liner of a, uh, uh, of a of a of a monstrosity push that old cow into the stars. That was a uh, that was when I when I think about going to space, I I can't help but think about um, just how sincere William Shatner was when he was talking about how mm. uh, you know when when set, he went, set up yeah set, set set this up for folks who don't have the context. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, uh, I was lucky enough to host a Q&A with William Shatner in Lubbock, Texas, a uh, little over, uh, less, uh, about a over year, a year ago. ago. Yeah, over a year over ago. Year ago. Yeah. Uh, and then um, uh, in it, you know, the question of what was it like to go to space came up. And keep in mind, the Blue Origin rocket really does go past the Kármán line. It really goes to legitimate space. But of course, you know, the pictures we see of space, we see, you know, just 
star-filled skies. Those are very highly curated. They're, you know, with incredible magnification. So space seems uh, awash with opportunities. Uh, and yet, when you're blinded by the reflected light of planet Earth beneath you, um, it's a different animal. You, the only thing to, that you can literally see outside of maybe the moon is the Earth beneath you. Yeah. And he describes in that, that wonderful Shakespearean poetry that only William Shatner can, uh, can manufacture, um, just this burning desire to want to go home and take very, very good care of Earth. Um, and I, I, I don't know, I reflect back on that because viscerally I understand why that would be the case. But, uh, but also it, it seems so clear that, that mankind's destiny is to you know, uh, get off of this rock. Sure, uh, and I think the way that uh, I remember him putting it is that when he finally got to space, as he had so famously been in fiction uh, as as Captain Kirk, what he saw as the reality was death. There was inky black death, and he looked back to Earth and saw it teeming with life, and he became very, very aware that the this is the difference that he wants to fight for. He wants to make Earth uh, uh, as as prosperous as possible. But I think I don't I don't know if it necessarily goes against the idea that you know America or sorry America although also America America <laughs> America, America before anybody else hey uh, uh, first in line buddy uh, uh, line forms it my butt uh, but uh, that Earth will survive by going to other planets. But at the same time, you don't need to fetishize how awesome the road is, and that's what space is. Space is just the place between. You know, life sustaining uh, uh, outposts. The question is, will we create and, and uh, you know, put people in those kinds of outposts? Yeah, especially as we, you know, we, we you know, in our generation and our, our, our children's generation. It's a, uh, it, <laughs> that sentiment of uh, the road out west is pretty harsh. Um, makes me think of uh, uh, our friend Andrew Heaton's story of his grandparents were, uh, you know, literal Oklahoma land rushers. And when they planted their flag, they were like, great, now what? And the answer was, um, hide from coyotes. Yeah. And so they literally dug a cave and slept in a cave. Like, his, he is two generations removed from cave dwellers. From cave dwellers, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, the... Frontier life ain't for the faint of heart. We are soft-handed, uh, uh, silly, silly bobbies uh, compared to the rough and tumble folks that have come before us, and will likely come after us for for the the price of settling the lunar frontier or the the spatial frontier. We're we're gonna need hard people because that that ain't that ain't an easy business, especially if we're looking to dig uh, uh, pressurized tubes into Mars or, or you know, terraform or anything like that? Where, where are you at on genetically modifying uh, human uh, pioneers? Um, and, and because this is... Uh, genetically modifying the, the, the sissy out of frontiersmen. Uh, well, but, I mean, I, but uh, it, it, you're about to have a child. Like, if you... What? <laughs> If if you if, let's say you know time time was advanced a little bit and it's just like hey with I assume it'll start with tiny little changes where it's like hey uh, we discovered this genetic marker that makes you fifty percent more hardened to uh, cosmic rays reducing your chance of getting uh, cancer while you're on Mars like uh, uh, do you do you accept that and then. And then the next, you know, uh, I don't know, let's say X number of years from now, then it's like, okay, you know, your bones get really uh, brittle and weak mm. when you're in zero gravity. Also, why do you have legs in zero gravity? Wouldn't you rather have four sets of arms? Um, we could just tweak that. Like, like it's going to be a series of, of interesting um I, I, I don't know, uh, uh, decisions that seem gross on the surface now to us, but it's like, 
it's like, okay, you're going to want the full package for a spacer. Uh, what does it include? Well, they're born, they're going to live, they're going to die in space. You're going to want their inner ear modified so that they're never dizzy. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Lay out the world where this is necessary. Because uh, it, it seems like you have a very specific world in mind where there are stratas of humans that are non-Earth or planetary. They are living in space exclusive. So, so before I judge your thoughts, yes. please lay out the world that you are filling out in your head. I give you, a, let's say, give or take the the expanse, right? Minus minus the uh, all right. So sci-fi load booth. OS the expanse. Yes. Yeah. Um, and and uh, something where are we also loading in the economic strata that kind of powers the story there that the the uh, non uh, planetary based people have less money and they're essentially wage slaves. We're, we're, uh, we could keep that in there, but we are going to mm, subtract the, the, the magic fast go go engines that they have that cause you be, to be able to go 1G each direction, uh, wherever you're okay, going. Okay, so we have slow boats. We have slow boats, which means that, you know, there's lots of problems with being unshielded from cosmic rays, there's lots of problems from being. Um, uh, at low G, your body so, becomes so brittle. So these people are not only living in space all the time, they are traveling between these destinations often. Yeah, and possibly, possibly, let's say, in, at the far end, and we don't have to go this far if you don't want to, let's allow for intergenerational travel. Let's say we find a couple of exoplanets that seem like good ideas that take, quote-unquote, only three to five generations of humans to live in a space arc. Um, although even then you'd have a little bit of gravity. But, it, but my point being, if you could modify uh, well, this, yeah, all right. would you? I, so I'm going to reject your concept on its face. Okay. Uh, uh, mostly because, it, no, I mean, my answer would be no, but I don't think, it's because I think it's a bad idea. It's because I would need... I don't think that we would be at a situation where you as an adult are modifying unless you are an extreme case. That this would have to be a way of life that is so ingrained that you would be looking at it as a service to your child that you would want to screen them or genetically edit them for a better life it would have to be we you had to watch polio kill a bunch of kids before it became a thing that every kid gets vaccinated for polio right right? Uh, and i guess an alternate scenario might be uh, literally the moon's gonna fall into the ocean and so we only have so much time time to get creative if if we want off Say that again? Uh, if the moon was going to fall into the ocean or, or some unstoppable asteroid or something was going to uh, destroy. And we had to leave in spaceships that have been hidden. Uh, oh, no, 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 no. Like, like, like let's, say, let's say we have, you know, X number 100 years, but, but there's one thing, like, ain't no Armageddon scenario, ain't no deep impact, ain't no uh, heroic fire rocket blast yeah. away let's say let's say uh, it's a cloud of moons sir and they're going to be here at so and so time uh we can we can immediately populate the stars uh uh, uh because you know uh, over the next 200 years if we do nothing but build elon musk's starships and and get out there uh, uh we could do it oh, you're, however you're, okay i got you you are you are setting up a scenario where we would have to eject into space immediately Relatively immediately. I mean, yes. enough. Let's give us a, a, f- a few generations, right? But even then, I still think that you wouldn't see broad uh, uh, genetic editing or anything like that. I, 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 I'd, I'd I, hate to admit it, but I think you're right because people still have. Uh, are you familiar with golden rice? Um, yes. The uh, like there are still there are still countries that make it illegal to accept golden rice because yeah. it's genetically modified. Uh, 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 golden rice is rich in vitamin A, saving the eyesight of children and the lives of children who primarily are raised on rice. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think obviously you get into some of the cultural elements of it, but you also, whenever you're talking about affecting children in general or parents' decisions about their kids, you're always going to naturally move in the most conservative direction. Like that, I think, is hard-coded into us as primates is first keep them alive how do i keep them alive i follow the guidance of everybody that was before me and i gather as much information about common wisdom right like and this we're, we're being bombarded with a lot of evidence through media and friends now my wife and i as we are about to welcome our first daughter but what <laughs> but uh in general it's not a lot of wacky stuff, right? It's not a lot of like, hey, always keep them in half a bowl of water. Like there's some of that. There's some elements. But in general, what you are looking at, the, the advice that cuts through are either time-tested things of here's what generations of people have done or a you people are bending over backwards to talk about the scientific reason why X, Y, or Z. But even then... We're talking about things like windows in which you feed them and then put them to sleep, right? Like like things that were going to happen anyway, but here's the specific Konami code to make them sleep through the night, stuff like that. It's not anything radical. So I think inherently you would have to see the problem. A generation would have to see a problem before they did anything so in your example let's say it's a cloud of moons that is going to hit earth we now have 200 years to figure out our where we're going to hide for the great uh, uh mooning right there would have to be a generation of people that left and then died at a specific rate before you would see any kind of initiative from people on earth to say okay if I'm having a kid now, they're going to be on a ship in 18 years. I want to make sure that they don't die like at the rate that these people did. And I think you're going to see every element of trying to stop that without any kind of medical intervention and only saving for that not working. So two generations, would you see people saying, oh, okay, well, maybe – if there was some sort of genetic screening or some sort of genetic editing, then this will be less than. But I, a lot of people would have to die before humans took a preventative measure to make somebody live. Yeah, I, I think you're right as far as uh, hardened cultural attitudes go. Um, uh, I wonder if two year, 200 years would be enough. That would be enough for you to see let's say two generations of best and brightest 18 year olds, like let's, let's say we're able to get to space and we're able to hollow out asteroids and we're able to build these moon bases, but, but the unpleasantness of zero G and, um, uh, and cosmic rays where it's like, like people who were there at the beginning of the program are still hale and hearty at 72 years old on earth and they're all like i've seen three generations of children go up and they've all died horrifically due to these disease I, yeah. I i could i could picture at that point saying um it's it's time for us to look about to look into tinkering with our code a bit if we intend to survive this but that's if yeah i i just think even in the realm of solutions i think at the first person who dies somebody there, there will be top men endeavoring <laughs> to make the next person not die just, just like there are already top men writing theses defending having sex with robots like there, there there isn't even a problem yet but they're already writing these like like finally yes well uh, that that particular issue i think <laughs> Thank you. You found a lot of volunteers in that army. You didn't really need to conscript them. That's been that's been on that's been on the wish list for a certain element of humanity for a, for a minute now. Oh come on, a bunch of moons, and somehow make it so that only there's one way to survive. <laughs> Wow, what a, what a weird new remake of The Last Starfighter, huh? <laughs> I wonder how you win the Excalibur Protocol in if that were, movie. <laughs> if it were a different show, the last word wouldn't be fighter. 
<laughs> Patreon.com yeah. slash weird things is where you can keep us rocking here at uh, weirdthings.com. Uh, Patreon.com slash weird things. You get early access to after things. Uh, just, just to prove that we're serious about it. We're not going to do it this week. Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> a few things have conspired against us. Number one, uh, the great Andrew Main is at uh, a, a, a conference, and uh, Brian has been waylaid by a long recovery from the COVID. Yeah, dude. Um, uh, I, I ain't going to go so far as to say I'm one of those long haulers, but um, uh, weirdly, I, I think I just got lucky the first two times. And had fairly short bouts, but uh, but even though you know I'm not infectious, I, I don't show antigens, I don't have a fever, um, the uh, I, I just a little bit of coughs and sniffles. But my goodness, I I don't usually sleep 16 hours a day, but I have been. It's yeah. been really, really you really have weird. about an hour of stage performance yes. in you. And then and then it's like and then like <laughs> and then and then I'm just like show me down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean we did we did great night on Tuesday and at the end of the at the end of the night I was like, is everything okay? And you're like Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> everything's everything's fine. It's okay. Everything's I, great right I, now. I, I, I beat I, be, I be COVID. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. good. Anyway. Patreon.com slash weird things. Keep us supported. Keep us in business. Heck yeah, dude. What oh, can I tell you something? Uh, uh a fun Austin moment that I had only in Austin, this city, on <laughs> uh on Wednesday. I go to get my teeth cleaned. Yeah. Turns out my dental hygienist, who I who has cleaned my teeth for the last several years, is in Robert Rodriguez's band. No way. Yeah. Uh and uh he was talking to me about stuff and we wound up getting on the subject of AI. Robert Rodriguez, according to my dental hygienist who plays in his band, or sources is obsessed with Udio. Oh, really? And keeps sending him Udio songs. <laughs> uh, to which my dental hygienist, I did not get to have much of a conversation with him since he had sharp objects pointed into my mouth as he scraped my teeth. So he just kind of went on a monologue about how he doesn't like AI or AI music. But uh, he was getting a little annoyed with his friend famous director and writer Robert Rodriguez because he kept sending him Udio songs and he was like man this one's great uh, uh, he's like this one's gonna sa- this is gonna save me so much money to which my dental hygienist reminded him Robert your son's a composer <laughs> okay <laughs> so um, uh, I mean well, I, I, our official response as a program has mm-hmm. I believe always been, that's why his son should learn the tools now so he can direct an orchestra. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess he, he yeah. Uh, 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 so I don't know. I mean, I, I think it follows along with the idea that a lot of like really big creatives have seized on AI for a lot of different practical reasons. There's a lot of different things that are kind of happening right now. And, and if you look at the, the development of it, how fast it's coming along, I mean, good Lord, uh, even AI music, you know, there was a uh, Wolf from Alpha uh, had a, or it wasn't Wolf from Alpha, but it was the same people that yeah. that did it, uh, had a computer generated music platform like years ago, like 10 years ago. Yeah, I think uh, like, uh, I think they even made a, a musical version of, of the game of life, you know, that the game where it's like, you start with a seed of like three dots and then mm-hmm. the rules are they duplicate in weird ways and it's like, whoa, man, you're listening to life. Yeah. Uh, now, that obviously was not large language model technology, but to the the end retail user, it was the same thing. I want a certain kind of song. Oh, my God, no human touches it. Now, all of a sudden, I've got a certain kind of song. Now, between Suno initially and then Udio, which to me holds the heavyweight championship when it comes to 
on uh, to to AI music, especially with their vocals, because the audio vocals are, are are clearer, pretty good. And and uh, whereas uh, Suno sounds a little bit um, uh, soupy, uh, like like a bit too much reverb on yeah. everything. But uh, that has been amazing, and it only continues to get better. The big question is, and this is something that's happened since the last time that we talked about AI music, is that uh, both Suno and Udio have been hit with the lawsuit I'm sure they were waiting for for you know however many months they've been operating. Uh, every major record label has sued them, saying there's no way that you could be doing this without using our copyrighted work to train your model. And you know we're going to find out this year and next year, I believe, a lot of the resolutions of these uh, cases and I don't know whether or not we're going to get actual judges decisions. It looks like the AI companies want that because they, they think that they are in the right when it comes to this or if the powers that be are just going to push for a licensing deal to say, uh, uh, okay, well you just pay us money and now you'll have the right to train things on this. Uh, the uh, uh, in an official statement, uh, the Beastie Boys were, were said to have said, "Whew, barely made it." <laughs> right before anyone knew it was a problem, uh, the Beastie Boys famously liberally sampled an awful lot and were uh, did so before the great controversy of the early '90s about how much sampling is sampling until you're just playing. Princes when doves cry and rapping yeah. over over it. Yeah, but I don't know if that's going to be the same uh, uh, the same thing that this is is guided on because you don't hear anything involving uh, uh, the songs that this model is trained on based on what you have. Some elements of it, but it, it would it be any different if you use just the best version of the Wolfram Alfred technology? Like, obviously, the answer is. Uh, uh, yes, because that technology cannot produce this result. But you know, uh, 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 the 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 reality of the models are that you're gonna rely less and less on this kind of stuff as soon as the model can detect the secret sauce that makes pop music pop music, that makes opera music opera music, that makes a score a score. Uh, uh, it's going to be able to use it to create these new these new treasures well and and that is that is one of the interesting things um uh, uh yes uh, uh, you can industrialize uh, feeding a large language model to a degree that it's difficult to do with a human but ultimately what is a human composer but somebody who you train on certain models and have them listen to why this is good that's good and the whole thing um, and then and then write their version of it. Even we talked a few years ago about temp tracks, and as iconic as the Star Wars theme is, when you hear the temp track that was used up until, you know, uh, John Williams was like, oh yeah, no no no, I get it, I get what they're doing. Uh, it, it's 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 if you heard them in reverse order, you would swear that one is a, a pale a direct rip. Yeah. of the other. Yeah. Um, same thing with like, uh, 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 I don't know, there's a bunch of music from uh, 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 Christopher Nolan films. And uh, I mean, it's if temp tracks are fair game and then somebody just comes in and, you know, just switches up the melody a bit, keeps those big hits, changes this, this well, brass to that brass. If, if, if I can go back to my dental hygienist, uh, he did have a few things that he complimented AI music for. The first was exactly that, inspiration. So essentially being able to use AI as a temp track that then gives you an idea that then you take in whatever direction you're going to take it. And he apparently does a lot of work for commercial and television music. So uh, being able to put things in a library that, commercials and television and movies will then take from to make whatever they're doing and sometimes you can kind of skip the line of the library and just go right into a show one of the shows that he is apparently working on something for or he got a request for i won't name it but let's say that it's a uh show about a post-apocalyptic future <clears throat> that has <throat> a very heavy influence of 1950s culture. Okay. So 
he was saying, all right, I have a song that's very much in the style of the 60s that he's like, I could actually use this to pitch to this show. Then he's like, well, but what do you what what do they think of as the 50s? Because the 50s had a lot of different music and and you can't just take some obscure song that you like, you know, the the Roy Donks of the world from the Colgate Hour and and decide that that is everything from the 50s. So he went on Udio and apparently asked Robert Rodriguez and said, hey, what's that website? And then <laughs> what's Rob- that website I hate so much? And then Robert Rodriguez was <laughs> like, oh, you were, bro, you were making fun of me yesterday, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but he wanted to do it so he could create a 50s song so he could hear what the AI thinks of when somebody asks for a 50s song. What are the hallmarks that you would immediately recognize as that? Because he wants to use the vocals and the timing of this ni- this more 1960s song, so well, and, and I thought that was that was an interesting uh, an interesting story. And of course, AI is as we've talked about before is essentially just a mirror of of whatever it's trained on. It's a mirror of what came before. So when you're asking an AI what it thinks, you're really asking what is give or take the sum total of humanity think a 1950s song sounds like. Yeah. Uh, uh, I hadn't noticed this one. Uh, I was thinking of the uh, the fanfare for um, uh, uh, the the Luke Skywalker theme, but but this is the the temp track. Do you know what the temp track is for um, uh, for uh, well here actually here this is a comparison here. This is the opening shot. Uh, so there's the the Tantive four being you know shot at by the large star destroyer. Uh, uh, I can't see anything if you're trying to show me something. Uh, well, I'm I'm deliberately not okay. trying to show gotcha. it okay. so that uh, so that I don't have to take it down. Gotcha. Uh, but then uh, I assume it's only a minute long clip here, so I assume it's about to play the original now. Okay, there we go. So, the, and then this is the uh, the planet. The temp track was Mars, the bringer of war, by yeah. by Holst, and so. And they're showing the same footage. Uh, and that, even that end part is very much reminiscent of that moment that they blow up the Death Star. Yeah. So anyway, temp tracks, uh, they're a real thing. It's its hard for me to distinguish the uh, the ethics of, of going from temp tracks to ML- LLMs. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, the, the, the question that then becomes is what is legal, right? Because at, at, at the end of the day, everybody's going to want to get paid. Uh, but you're you're more on the ethics thing because that's probably the conversation that you're more enmeshed in with your with your artistic family that has controversially explicit opinions about AI. Well, and uh, here's one thing I know as a dad is the fastest way to convince your kids of the opposite of what you want to convince them to is to argue with them. So mm. so I've kept my mouth fairly shut and just shrugged and say like, well, seems like it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but uh, but I, I do wish that, um, you know, uh, for any artist, when you're getting started or you feel like, uh, you know, you barely have caught the end of a shooting star, uh, it's easy to feel like those flashes of inspiration are fleeting and rare. Um, and the idea that they could be roboticized is pretty terrifying. And I'm yeah. sure that's how it was for assembly line workers on you know, Ford's assembly lines and and on and, and for the weavers in India who felt like, you know, no machine can perfectly craft what they do with the loom and all of that. So it's like my 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 impulse is to be very, very kind and thoughtful, but but I wish I knew I, I, I really nothing but to be honest, it, it kind of goes back to that genetic engineering thing. It's good, nothing but actually seeing the results is going to convince people of otherwise. Like, before you consider genetically modifying human gene stock, you're gonna have to watch three generations go up and then melt in 20 years in space 
before you think, okay, maybe we should consider this. Yeah, I, I do think that AI is going to be a little bit different in terms of mass adoption against criticism because we've yet to see it really even be on mass scale fully deployed into the things that we use all the time. We're mm -hmm. only just now beginning to just see a lot of manual things that are dumb, that are time consuming. Now they're going to be totally uh, uh, wrapped up in AI. Menial tasks are going to be a lot easier because of things that are not controversial, but they're just faster to do. Uh, uh, with like, AI. You know, like 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 doing doing the laundry, you know, when when that Tesla bot is able to be all like, yeah, I got it, I got it. Well, I, I'm I'm thinking of more web things now, but sure, yeah, down the road, absolutely. Uh, uh, I'm I'm thinking of things like uh, your books, taxes, your yeah. uh, uh, keeping track of all of your. Um, your subscriptions just having more like I, i've talked about this a lot uh we've done nothing but with our smart devices our watches and our and our phones kept meticulous recordings of everything our biometrics our text messages our emails and it's a lot our photos it's a lot of data for what? Like, what do we actually get out of it? Aside from just very, very, very rudimentary counting stats on, cer on certain things. You burned this amount of calories yesterday and this amount of calories a week from now. Like, that doesn't really give you a projection, doesn't tell you anything more about your life, it doesn't tell you anything better. We are at a point now where a lot of that is just going to magically get better. And people aren't going to really know why. They'll just know, oh, it, it does an AI thing. It's just going to be a rising tide. Right now, what freaks people out are the all-in-one magic boxes. The and, and and many of those are useful. It's been AI music has been useful to us as we have worked on episodes of World's Greatest Con, where before I was looking through moods in public uh directories or uh, you know that you had to pay for but but they are publicly available directories for music which is why sometimes you'll hear podcast theme songs or or songs that you've heard from somewhere else in commercials because everybody's fishing from the same pond to ai music now all of a sudden if i need a a a a, a, a song a, a a brooding cinematic score that uh, uh is mysterious but has naval elements to it right well, i get that immediately and i can go through five different versions of it until i get the closest to what i want and on the top of that you could say layer some sci-fi elements not even knowing what you mean by sci-fi elements yeah. but instead you get like some flange and a little bit of harsh you know synth edges to it and you're like yeah that's what i want that yeah. kind of thing uh, but, you know, other than that, if you're not in a professional capacity to use this kind of stuff, then it does just seem scary. It does just give you an existential worry of, well, why am I learning guitar? Or why am I uh, learning to draw? Why am I learning X, Y, and Z when it's going to be easy? I'm very much with Andrew's perspective on this, who has been far more in the belly of the beast of a lot of uh, the, the bleeding edge of this technology that you're always going to want to know what you want out of this thing by learning those tools because you're going to be so much better at getting exactly what you want. And when the bar for all this stuff starts going up, the music starts getting better, starts sounding more professional, the graphics all are clean, like, like when, when all that happens, the, that little bit is going to be the difference between what everybody does and what you can do. So I, I still think that a lot of those talents are really, really important. It's just not the same thing as, okay, well, I'm going to learn guitar so I can record my guitar into it. I still think that that's going to be a really, really valuable tool. It'll just be different. It'll have more utility. Yeah, I, uh, I think there's kind of two levels. Uh, number one, think about, uh, you know, as we've talked about before, I am of the belief that we're all directors now you know we're all in charge we're all managers in charge of writers rooms and so on and which means our our jobs which are the same jobs we've always had in the arts are number one know what's wrong with something know the difference between good and bad and be able to point to what's bad about it and then number two uh have the words 
and that's the new part, is just have the words to explain why it's wrong. Yeah. You know, in the case of Whiplash, it's quite simply not my tempo. Like, that was, um, uh, you know, whether, whatever you perceive that movie to be about, when J.K. Simmons says, not my tempo, you knew that the problem was the tempo. Yeah. <laughs> that, that the guy was not doing right. And um, uh, I, now, personally, I can't wait to throw a symbol at the head of an A.I., but <laughs> maybe maybe it'll cause all of us to become raving megalomaniacs. <laughs> well, some of us are already there. <laughs> hey, man, uh, you got any picks? Uh, yeah, picks. I, I can go uh, first if you want. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll just do House of the Dragon. It's okay. <laughs> Hey, these dragons, they did a big dragon fight. If you, if, boy, you ever wanted to see dragons fighting. D dragon fighting is weird because <laughs> it's so much better in your head than it is in reality. And this is the problem with House of the Dragon for whatever the rest of the plot issues is that dragons are awesome, right? Sure. People riding dragons... It's it's sort of like kind of silly. There's one element that like, do we really need that that part? <laughs> Just like, like like, hey, maybe go left. Thanks, boss. I never thought about that. Yeah. I'm only a dragon who flies. What would I know about it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I, I uh, house of the dragon. Where else are you gonna keep dragons? In a house. In a house. In the house, there, uh, there was a uh, fantasy slash science fiction book series called um, uh, the uh, the Adept series from Pierce Anthony, and uh, it was like two worlds. One was a fantasy world, one was a sci fi world, and they were separated by a curtain. And if you were cool, you could go and you know inhabit the body of your match on the other side. Mm. But uh, but like it turns out, like you know, like like uh, the O. Henry short story. Both sides wanted what the other one had, so the science fiction side, they would take like brains of dogs and put them in cybernetic bodies. So they were like, "Hey, man, we got dragons. We got dragons too mm. over here." Mm. <laughs> uh, my pick is Fargo. Fargo season five. If you Fargo, you will go far. Uh, that uh, this was maybe so far. I I think I'm on episode six of eight. Uh, maybe the most over-the-top cartoonish of them so far. Uh, it's uh, in that there's a very, very good person who's very, very good and awesome at everything always, and there's a very, very bad person who's very, very bad. Yeah. And then they go out of their way to make it clear how bad, bad, bad they are. Uh, but there are a couple of interesting mushy middle characters, uh, but it's... Uh, when, when I say it's the most cartoonish Fargo yet, I mean that as a high, high compliment. It, it brought me vibes of um, uh, uh, of Legion almost in in the over the topness of how awesome it everyone is. Yeah, you know, and I would totally agree with that. It is more of a morality play, and as you can as you matriculate your way through the series, I think that you have identified a theme that will reward you. Uh, Fargo as a series tends to recycle a lot of characters from not only the Fargo movies, but the kind of wider Coen brothers universe. Like you will see a lot of archetypes that have been in other Coen brothers movies, uh, uh, things. This one has a few of them. It, it's it got the overly competent uh, uh, sidekick, the domineering boss, the nearly impossible henchman who is, you know, got his own weird uh, 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 world about him. But you're right. Our two poles are our hero and our villain. There is no question who has the halo and who has the horns. Uh, and as you move along, uh, I think you will, you will very much enjoy that, 
it, it gets to do some pretty like brutal medieval storytelling because it's not here to tell you maybe the good guy's bad or maybe <laughs> yeah. the bad guy's good. I, I would be very surprised if that's where it suddenly went. Yeah, I mean, obviously you you have moments of weakness or moments of uh, uh, manipulation that that shade around the 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 white and black uh kind of hues of uh, either of these characters but there's no question there's there is a very 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 bad person there is a very 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 good person and you're going to see the good person tested and you're going to see the bad person try to prosecute uh uh the 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 villainous plan so i'm so excited for you to get to the end of it Th there were you're you're next to it. You're close to it, I believe. Have you gotten to the episode where she meets the the mother? Uh, yeah. She she meets the mother, and the mother offers her a gig. And no, okay, it's, no, no, that, no, that's no, the no. one I just finished. Okay, you haven't. All right, I won't I won't spoil anything. Yeah. Uh, Noah Hawley is a very very big talent. He did. A version of an episode that I hate. It's usually a hallmark that this is a trash show, and the man pulled it off. All right, and and it's it's in this series. Oh, oh yeah, Jerry. Okay. All right. Oh, yeah. All right. All right. All oh right. yeah. I'm I'm totally here for it. Yeah. Um, man. Uh, well, I guess uh, I guess those are our picks. We'll hear back from one Andrew Main next week. Sorry. Oh that yeah. We we're keeping it short this week, but uh, but dug on it. Thank you to our patrons over at patreon.com slash weird things. We're keeping it real and keeping it relatively on time. Yep. Uh, thank you, everyone. It's been weird. Uh, all right, I'm cutting off the stream early. Thanks, right. thanks to everyone who shut it. Cut it. This was this is a bad one. This is a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right, love you guys. <laughs> prep, prep sauce. All right, bye.